Well, good morning. Welcome to Riverwood. Glad you're here to worship with us this morning. If you would, stand up with us. I want to do a little leader response as we start worshiping this morning. Um, I'm going to say God is good, and you're going to say? Okay, so you know this, and then I'll say all the time. Okay, let's give it a try. Ready? God is good, and all the time. All right, let's sing that. Let's see how awake we are, too. See if we can clap. Seed of it. 
That's why we're here in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to worship you uh, as your church. Uh, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, welcome. Glad you're here to worship with us. If you're a visitor with us this morning, your first, second, or third time, just want to uh, offer a warm welcome to you and uh, say we're glad you're here. If you would do something for us, if you would fill out the communication card in the seat back in front of you, that'll give us a chance, a way to get to know you, get some information into your hands about who we are as a church, uh, and uh, you can drop that off either in the offering basket as it comes by or uh, out at the Welcome um, Center. Few things we want you to know about. One is that there's a correction in the bulletin, and that is that the women's Bible study on Tuesday evenings will be at 7 p.m. Just wanted to make that note if you saw that. Uh, next amount announcement is actually in a video. If you want to wear one of those neon yellow green shirts, uh, you have to sign up either this Sunday or next Sunday or online throughout this week because uh, there's a volunteer training meeting next Sunday right after church for all the volunteers. So it takes about 150 folks to pull this off. Uh, it's a whole lot of fun. So um, go ahead and sign up either out at the ministry information counter or on the web for that. Camp Riverwood. This Saturday, there's a moving home party. Um, for those in our community who are moving from transitional housing into permanent housing, we as a church like to come around them and throw them a party and celebrate. It's a huge event. And so if you want to be a part of either um, Saturday night being a part of that or helping provide some of the things for that party, uh, you can go out and get to the ministry information counter. Okay, this, um, I think this starts today, actually, summer teachers and assistants. I think sometimes we talk about needing teachers, and everyone thinks, well, someone else is going to do that. Um, we still have some significant holes in for summer teachers and summer assistants. So if, if you were kind of on the fence as to whether or not this is an opportunity you'd like to be a part of, we could really use your help in this way. So Maggie and Amy will be out at the uh, Welcome Center this morning. So in between any of the services, find them, let them know if you're interested. If uh, you are looking to get more connected into this church, uh, today there's going to be a, what we call a Sunday lunch. Uh, this is for new folks to connect, to meet people, but also if you've been here for a while but you've never actually gotten involved with anything, this would be a great thing to come to. It's right after the third service in the gathering space, uh, and that's today. So if you want to just stick around and stay, you could do that. And then last uh, announcement here is uh, we're looking for minibus drivers. Now, at first I saw that and I thought this is a bus driver who's mini. But that's not what it's talking about. This is a minibus, and we're looking for drivers. And this means you don't need any sort of special license. But Kent Healthcare is going to let us use their minibus, and um, we're going to recruit some drivers to kind of take some, go through some of the surrounding neighborhoods and help bring people to church here on Sundays. So that'll be, that'll be really neat. So if you want to be a driver... Um, and you have your license, I should say that, uh, informational meeting June 8th uh, in room 118. Okay, this is the Sunday when we recognize those who have graduated. So if you have graduated from either high school or college, would you stand? I just want to uh, have you introduce yourself and say where you've graduated from. Anyone graduate high school, college, grad school? 
kindergarten. No, just All right. A couple of them over here. All right, so tell us your name and where you graduated from. Akron University. All right, and Matt. All right, yeah, we clap for that. Awesome. Well, congratulations. A lot of hard work. <laughs> well, as we transition back into worshiping God this morning, the um, question I've been thinking about is where does, where does praise come from? What is the source of our worship of, to God? And a lot of people, when they hear that question, they think, you know, our, our worship of God, it, it comes from the overflow of our experience. You know, so God's blessing us. Uh, we're prospering. Life is going great. And, and the overflow of that is praise, right? It's worship. Um, the problem is when you look through Scripture, that's not what praise is. Praise is not the overflow of our experience. Praise is the overflow of our faith. Because if you look through Paul's life, if you look through David when he was being chased by Saul, if you look through many of the Psalms, their circumstances weren't going very well. But it's not the overflow of their experience. It's the overflow of their faith. Their God hasn't changed. God is still powerful. He's still strong. He's still good. Even when life isn't going well, there's still a reason to praise him, reason to worship him. And so I don't know where, where all of us are this morning. Some of us... You know, life might be full of blessings. Others, life might be really hard. But the call is still to, to praise and to worship God. And that is an expression of our faith. So if you would stand with me, we're going to worship God together.
This is Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need.
sing of his love for me. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. Perfect, spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hidden with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. In the book of Revelation, there's songs that the saints are going to sing. Uh, and in, in chapters 4 and 5, there's some different refrains. And I'd love for us to, to say them out loud together. Holy, holy, holy.
pray. Lord in heaven, your name is great, and that is why we're here this morning, to praise you, to worship you, and to honor who you are in our lives, our redeemer, our healer. As we've sung this morning, you are the center of it all, and is it with, with tremendous gratitude that we gathered this morning as your church to honor that, and we thank you for your presence with us here this morning. Lord, we leave our troubles and the challenges of, of the world outside, and, and we gather together to focus solely on thanking you and praising you this morning. Lord, we are mindful this morning, and, and as we celebrate the accomplishments of those who, among our congregation, have recently graduated from high school or college, we're, we're grateful for their accomplishments and particularly grateful for their knowledge of you and their relationship with you. And as they step into a new life and, and a new chapter of their lives, we pray that they will continue to know you and continue to build that relationship with you into that next phase, whether it's moving on to college or, or to, uh, to the work world, the, the real world as we call it, uh, that each chapter in our lives has a unique place in your relationship with us, and we pray for them as they enter that. We also pray for Mary Jane Zimmerman this morning, who serves with New Tribes, a member of our congregation who's been working at a different kind of school, a missionary training school, and, and serving those students who, as they graduate from there this spring and start heading to the field to bring your gospel to tribal cultures in parts of the world that haven't heard it, we, we're grateful for Mary Jane's service and, and Certainly, uh, as she begins preparations for her retirement later this summer, we're grateful for your blessing in her life uh, that she's been able to serve that way, and we look forward to welcoming her back here. Lord, as we study your word this morning, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to receive it, to understand it as Cole brings it. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. And I'm going to ask you to stand back up for the reading of God's word. Sorry. <laughs> the reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I'm sending the brothers so that your boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, as I said that you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated, to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift and not as an exaction. Okay, now you may be seated. <laughs> well, good morning. Should we stand back up for the sermon too? This, uh, <laughs> we are glad you are here to worship with us this morning as we examine God's word and what he has to say to us. Um, are you ready I saw that phrase over and over again in the reading that John gave us. Are you ready? Are you ready? Will you be ready? Are you ready? And so the question that we're going to ask this morning is, are we ready? To which, yeah, I mean, people are ready. They don't even know what they're ready for, but they're ready. Well, this morning I was thinking through uh, this passage and I was reflecting on this past week. We spent a day where we were at a pool. Isn't this nice summer weather we're experiencing here in Ohio? What a, this is why we live in Ohio right here, right? So I was sitting on the edge of the pool and I was throwing, I have some boys next to me, and I was throwing a ball out from the pool and, uh, and they would jump out and try to grab it. And, uh, and before they would jump, I would look at them and I would say, are you ready? And they would kind of be there at the edge with their toes hanging off. And they would be kind of like, um, yeah, I'm ready. And there was anticipation in their eyes. And there was also uh, a little bit of trepidation. Like, I don't know what I'm getting myself into, but I'm ready. Because when I'm asking the question, are you ready? 
below that question is basically, are you ready to sacrifice it all to catch the ball? I'm going to throw it out there. Are you ready to sacrifice and give it all to catch it? And the kids were like, yes, we're ready. We're ready. And it was interesting as they jump, you know, sacrificing, belly flop, grabbing the ball. You know, as some would emerge from the bubbly water with the ball, you know, the joy on their face. And so this morning, as we talk about are you ready? There's another topic that we're going to look at. And if you've been with us last week, you know that for two weeks, this being the second week, we're going to be talking about giving. And not just giving anything, but giving specifically of our money. And that's that same metaphor that I'm going to talk about this morning. Are you we ready? And we could all say we are being called to the edge of the pool today. And we're asking the same question. Are you ready? And below that is the question of, are you ready to sacrifice? Are you ready to do what God is calling you to do with the money that he has entrusted into your care? And we're sitting there on the edge of the pool and we're like, I'm ready. And there's maybe some trepidation and fear and there's anticipation and excitement and we're ready, right? We're ready to hear what God is going to say to us about this this commodity that is so near and dear to every single one of us, money. And so as you looked into um, the passage we're going to look at this morning, he is calling us all to the edge of the pool. And I have one clarification. This is for everybody who calls Riverwood Community Chapel their home. If you are our guest or if you're just visiting, then we understand that this is not a place that you will give money Um, But we also understand that hopefully maybe you'll land here or maybe you have a home church. But these principles, these timeless truths are true wherever you worship, wherever you call your church home. And so know that. But we are calling everybody who calls this their church home to the edge of the pool today to hear what God has to say about giving and giving up money. Now, Paul said it right there at the beginning to the people of Corinth. He said, are you ready? And he said things like, I have heard about your zeal. I have heard about your excitement. I have heard all of these things. He's actually been bragging them up to everybody outside of Corinth. Can you believe the Corinthians said this about money and they're going to give this and they are so, they've said this. But at some point, we'd have to have the modern colloquial phrase talk is cheap, Corinth. Talk is cheap. And so now Paul is saying things like this. Are you sure you're ready? I'm going to come and I'm going to be there. And he even said it. Hopefully I'm not ashamed of you. Hopefully you're not going to make me look bad. Hopefully it's not going to be embarrassing. Because I've been building you guys up. Are you going to be the kind of ready givers that that I am calling you to be? And God's word calls us to be. So again, we're going to examine 2 Corinthians chapter 9. For this week. So if you have your Bible, open up. We'll open up to chapter 9 and verse 6. We're going to start. And Paul starts off and he, he lays it out there right from the beginning in, in verse 6. And this is what he says The point is this whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. All right. We've heard this metaphor over and over again. If you think preachers use the same kind of stories all over again, Paul could be accused of the same thing. Come up with a different illustration, Paul. You use this one a lot. But the ancients knew this one. Farming, sowing seed, they knew it. So lots of truths were drawn from this visual metaphor. And the metaphor is, is, it goes like this, that the farmer, as he sees his prepared fields, he doesn't go out there with one seed and put it in the ground. And then he takes another one seed and then put that in the ground and one seed and put that in the ground. That's not how it was going to go. That's a waste of labor. The picture is of the farmer who goes out to the prepared field. He has a satchel of seed and he puts his hand deep down in and he grabs as much as he can. As it's overflowing, he flings it out into the field and the prepared land 
He is, he is bountiful in his, in his planting so that there will be a bountiful harvest. And there is a universal maxim at work here. And the universal maxim is this. If you're going to put one seed in and then another seed here, if you're going to do this very sparingly, you are going to grow things that are sparingly. Or if you are going to do it in a bountiful way, in generosity, then you will reap a harvest that is going to be bountiful. And he uses the same connection, the same metaphor to speak of our money. The same thing is true, sparingly and bountifully. That same truth is true. And this illustrates where we were last Sunday. We studied from chapter 8 that generosity is a foundational part of being a Christian. And it speaks of our maturity and how generous we are. And this is, we saw it in the Macedonians. Paul will say, it is crazy what they are giving. I mean, they have nothing that they give and give and give. And to the average person who would see how much they are giving, it seems so, what are they doing? That makes no sense. They were giving so generously. And this kind of generosity is prompted, as we saw, by the grace of God. Last week, chapter 8, the grace, the grace, the grace. The God's grace is the thing that prompts us to give in this kind of generous fashion. So we now get to chapter 9, and Paul wants to lay out how do you become generous? How do we grow in our generosity? It's a hard question to answer because from the very, very beginning, I don't know about you, but I grew up being very selfish. I didn't want to share with other kids my toys. I didn't want to share anything, right? This is how we all began. It's not like you have to teach your kids which cookie do you want. They automatically are scanning which one is bigger, which one has more chocolate chips in it. They, they know exactly which one they want. And they're not thinking about giving the one that's bigger to somebody else. They're saying, I want that one. See, this idea of generosity is not something that we are accustomed to, that we are, we are born with. It is hard. It is against our nature. And so we ask the question, how will we grow in this grace of giving? Because it is a growth, something we will develop. And so this idea is a difficult one, but it is vital to God's people and how they will display and incorporate this into their lives. So let's see how we can do that. Paul is going to give us a snapshot, a picture of what it looks like to be someone who is generous in giving and in growing in these things. Verse 7 will say this. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's such a simple verse, but there are so much, so many profound truths in this verse. Four different phrases make up this verse. And it gives us, again, this snapshot of what a generous giver looks like, a ready giver. And so we're going to break, break them up, spend some time looking at each phrase for just a little bit. And the first one is this. Each one must give. Again, a great place to start. So simple, a simple truth, one that I wish I had learned earlier in my Christian walk. See, the idea is that everyone, everyone, there's no exclusions. Everyone is called to be a giver. It's not like we're like that person, that person, and that person. They look like they should be givers. We are all to be givers. I was a freshman at the University of Akron, and I had a part-time job. And I was making five-something an hour, 20 hours a week. And uh, so that's, you can do the math, about 100 bucks a week. And so I was going to a chapel in Akron, going to church there, and it was a wonderful place to worship. Several thousand people were there, a college ministry with several hundred students, and there was lots of things going on, lots of ministries, and lots of, you could tell there was a big budget, and there was lots of money there, and I was thinking to myself, here I am, 19, 20 years old, I'm making 100 bucks a week. Apparently, this gigantic church doesn't need my money. They're doing quite well without it. Oh, I was so naive. I was missing something that God was trying to teach me. 
that I didn't want to listen to. And I didn't grow in that. It took a while to understand that each one must give. See, he's not calling out certain people to give. And, and in my young, naive phase, I was like, well, that person looks like they should probably be given, and he looks like he should give. She looks like she has a, she's doing pretty good. Those are probably the ones who will give. The rest of us are just going to just ride on those coattails. And I thought that for so many years. And I was so naive, and I was missing this truth that God is calling all of his people to the edge of the pool, all of them who he has lavished his grace his grace through his son, Jesus Christ. He is calling all of us to the edge of the pool. Not just some of us. Let's keep adding on to the verse. It says this, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. This speaks to How much, right? Paul could have so easily have gotten to the how much question, right? Each one must give $300. Signed, delivered. I'm going to come pick it up on my way through. Or he even could have said this. Each one must give 10%. The very biblical Old Testament principle, the, the, the tithing, the tenth. He could have said that. But he doesn't say that. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. His heart. And so he wants us to then take a step back and ponder. Not just a spurious kind of, I think I should give this. But to step back and to ponder what is in your heart. It's a good question to ask because if we look at the heart of people who aren't Christ followers, we know that there's... Greed and there's lots of pursuing the things of this world, the things that we need. The, you will do any of these things to move ahead. There's prestige and there's, there's power and money and status and all of the things in the heart of the world that we live in. And it expresses itself in doing whatever it takes to get more and more and more and to stockpile and to get it and to be seen as somebody important. But what Paul is trying to say here is, I want you to go into your heart, the heart of a Christ follower, and discern what does your heavenly father want? What does he desire? I see, I know what the world's path is. I want you to discern what is in the heart of your heavenly father. And so I was making a list of things, even short lists. Here are some things that our heavenly father, his heart beats for. A love for the lost, lost coins, lost sheep, lost people. A concern and a passion for the disadvantaged. Injustice. A compassion for widows and orphans and those who are lonely. A love for truth and a desire for the whole world to hear the gospel. You see, these are the things on the heart of our Heavenly Father. And for those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, these things too should be the things that our heart beats for. And so when Paul says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, you hear things like this and you think, how can we not be generous? How can we not give? Open up our our wallets and our hearts to say, dear God, use it to your ends for your glory. These are the things that I want. These are the things I want to see happen. And after you spend time discerning what is in your heart, there's something that wells up inside of us to figure out what are the things of eternal value and what are those things that are fleeting, fleeting, fleeting. There's a simple little book. I've mentioned it before. It's called The Treasure Principle. It's written by Randy Alcorn. You can read the book probably in 30 minutes. It's that small. But it's a wonderful little read exactly on this topic. He talks about are we building up treasures here on this earth, investing in things of this world of power and prestige, or are we building and using our money to invest in things of eternity? A great question to ask. 
Martin Luther, who lived several hundred years ago, the reformer, would say this, I've had many things in my hands that I have lost. The things that I place in the hands of God, I still possess. There's some great wisdom there. Well, let's continue on in this verse. Each one must give, we're all called to the edge, as he is decided in his heart. And then he says this, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Not reluctantly. The word actually means painful. Pain. And then under compulsion, a word that means to be forced. It's almost like arm twisting, right? Arm twisting. And I was thinking this past week, how much of our money that comes out of our pockets is in this kind of way, with reluctance or under compulsion? Here comes the water bill. Yay! Right? (laughs) April 15th, I owe money. I can't believe it. It's so wonderful. And there are so many experiences where money comes out in ways that are reluctant and under compulsion. One writer would describe it this way. It's a beautiful picture where you think of a towel that is filled with water that is then being wrung out. And so many times we feel like money is being wrung out of us. And so we bring that same kind of attitude to the edge of the pool and we think, do I really have to give this? Do I really? And there's reluctance and compulsion. And even the, the brother of compulsion is good luck, right? I'm going to have to give this money because I don't, want, I don't want God to do something bad to me. That's the last thing I want. So yeah, here you go. It's almost like you're paying off the bully with your lunch money. I'm going to give just so I can get this out of the way. And so there is much reluctance and compulsion And that attitude is easy to spring into the idea of giving our money as well. God doesn't want that kind of attitude. That's why he put the next piece in. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, under compulsion, with your arm being twisted, but more like this. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Think about someone special who in your life who is having a birthday that's coming up and you think about that perfect gift you're going to go out and buy for them. You have an excitement, don't you? You spend the money, you go and you wrap it up and you've, you, can't, you can't wait for that moment where they will then be in front of that gift and they will tear it open and you will look and see their reaction on their face and it'll be cheerful. Giving. That's what it looks like. And as Paul will say, cheerful givers that get, that get to participate in the work that God has planned for his church. There might even be shouts of joy as we take collections of money, right? Yes! The kingdom is advancing. And I get to play a part in that. And I am giving to something that has eternal value. I want to give to the things that God has on his heart and what is motivating him. That's something worthwhile to give to. And so as a church, those who sit in the blue chairs, many times they wonder, well, where is my money even going? What does it look like? I give, but what's the church doing with it? It's a great question to ask. As a church, we are passionate about worshiping God and loving people, reflecting Christ. And all the things that we do, this drives us and to find ministries and people to do these kinds of things. And if you want to know more about our finances, we are completely transparent. We don't hide anything. If you go online, and uh, the next slide will show you, if you go to resources for you up in the right-hand corner, you drop down there. One will be called financial information. And there is lots of information for people who love income statements and balance sheets. It is all right there. There's nothing that we are hiding because we want to be seen as people who are giving in the ways that is God honoring.
And we have a team of people here who love the Lord and who love numbers, a fiduciary board. They love watching to see where the nickels and dimes go, Uh, nickels and dimes that go to missionaries far away, and nickels and dimes that go to turning on lights, all of it that is necessary for the worship of God here in our church. Well, Paul has described this picture. It's a snapshot he gives us in in verse 7 of what a ready giver looks like. Each one must give as he has decided, not reluctantly, but God loves cheerful, cheerful giver. And as he asks us, as we sit there on the edge of the pool, are you ready? It's like, yes, it's going to be hard and it's going to be partly unknown, but I am willing to give in these kinds of ways he is calling me to. And the rest of the chapter, he explains the results of living and giving in this kind of way. For those who step out to the edge, let's look and see. When God's people give, this is what happens in verse 10. He will say this. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. See, I think one of the fears that people have in stepping out to the edge is they're always thinking about, if I give sacrificially the way that God is calling me to, what is that thing I'm going to be missing out on? And for the college student, they think about tuition and and rent and all of those things. And for the young families, they think about, well, we're planning on having a family and, and, and having a house and paying for that. And you could go on from stage to stage to stage, and you could always get to the edge, and you can always be like, mm, I'm not quite sure. But notice what, what Paul says to the giver, the benefit. Notice what he says, that God will take care. He will supply He will multiply so you can give and give and be generous. He will take care of you. Luke chapter 12, Jesus would tell a parable about money. We heard Jesus likes to talk a lot about money. And this is one of his parables. There are people who are arguing over an inheritance. How much money? What should we do with it? And Jesus says this. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying this, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, take it easy, eat and drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Don't worry. Your heavenly father will take care of you. He will provide your needs. Scripture tells us he takes care of the birds. Won't he take care of you as well? Be generous. He is in control. And what Paul will say here is that he is the one who puts seed in the satchel. He is the one who will supply it. He is the one who will multiply it. And it's not so that we will have more and bigger and health and wealth and the great giving. It's not about us. It is about him. Notice, he says, it is about increasing the harvest of your righteousness. In a world that is filled with unrighteousness, he is needing his people to be generous so that his righteousness will continue on. And you will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way. And you will be thankful. That's what it looks like. He will take care of people who give, his generous givers. 
So not only is there something for those who give, but also those who receive. Look what he says in verse 12. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. And what Paul is saying is this, is God is also going to take care of the one who is going to receive that gift. And you're like, "Ah, of course he is. They're receiving something. That's good for them. A couple of years ago, there was a a need in the Dominican Republic, and we raised funds to send money down so that one of our missionaries who travels around in a truck in the sugarcane fields could have an updated truck. The one he drove around was not built for the terrain of sugarcane fields. And so we sent down money And uh, we replace that. And that's what Paul will say here, is that is what's called supplying the needs of the saints. There was a need, we supplied it. There was a receiving of that for Ney Sanchez, one of our missionaries. But that is only a portion of the benefit for the receiver. Notice what he says, that there's also going to be a thanksgiving. In verse 13, he says, the recipients will glorify God as they see Christ-like cheerful generosity of others. And what Paul is saying is that Ney Sanchez, who knows only a handful of us, he knows something about our church. He knows something about the generosity of this place. And it says something about our confession of Jesus Christ. It says something about who we are and what we stand for. And because of our generosity, it has now gone to him. And Ney is someone who is so grateful And many times we're around him, he'll say things like this, I am praying for your church. I am praying for your church, that God will use you, because he knows the heart of what we gave to him out of a generous heart. And his kingdom is advancing over and over again. And so it's like a, a giant and massive chain reaction. God is the one who fills the pouch. We are the ones who generously give. And those who receive then receive and give honor and glory to their heavenly father. All of it in thanksgiving to him. And so we get to the edge of the pool and we wonder, now what? What are we being called to do? What is God's word really asking of us? Well, he's asking us to step out to the edge. Everyone must give what he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but to be a cheerful giver. My challenge for Riverwood Community Chapel is that we take some time to figure this out and to be challenged by God's word in this area. Because he's asking the same question, not only to those who were in Corinth, but he's asking us as well. Are you ready to be the kinds of generous givers I'm calling you to? And as a reminder, I just pulled one of these out and the seat backs in front of us. These are our blue giving envelopes. And you can take one of these with you as a reminder and maybe a way to challenge yourself. And maybe to challenge yourself, some might be here for the first time who are being called to the edge of the pool to be givers. And maybe you don't have a discipline of giving. What does that look like for you? God is calling you to be generous. Maybe he's wanting you to examine your heart. What's really in your heart? Does your heart beat for the things of Christ? Or do they beat for the things of this world? Maybe there's a reminder there and something to check. Or maybe something about giving under compulsion. You think, oh, every Sunday, here it goes. Here, take it from me. Or maybe there's something about cheerfulness and generosity and something that God is doing in your life and you're like, I need to reassess how I am giving because I need to give to the generous God who has given me so much. He's calling us to the edge of the pool. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? 
Well, as we conclude this whole series, just a couple of weeks on giving, we get down to chapter 9, and the very last verse of this chapter is a great reminder of the God we worship. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Thanks be to our Heavenly Father, who is the pinnacle example of generosity. This word inexpressible only shows up one time in the New Testament. Paul uses it here. He says, thanks be to God for his, I can't even talk about it. It's his inexpressible gift he has given you. He has lavished upon you. Our heavenly father is not stingy. Our heavenly father is not miserly. He's not thinking, eh, I don't know if they deserve it or not. He lavishly has given us an inexpressible gift through his son, Jesus Christ. And because of that, he calls his people to the edge to be generous, just like him. Let me pray for us. Dear God, we submit ourselves to your word each and every week. And we know that you are calling us to a higher standard And the things that we hold dear and near to our hearts, our money, you call us to say, are we ready to be generous? Are we ready to be generous givers? People who don't give because they have to, but people who give because they get to join in the work that you are doing, building your kingdom for all of eternity. What a privilege it is. And I pray for Riverwood Community Chapel that it would be seen as a place of generosity, not a place of stinginess and miserliness, but one that we have generous, lavish givers because of the generous and lavish grace that you have given to us. May this be the mark of us as individuals as well. We give you thanks this morning. We praise in your name. Amen. Thanks, Cole. At the heart of this message is really a message of surrender. Well, we surrender our, our things, but really will we surrender our whole lives. And so we're just going to end with a, a really a response song to God, uh, a song of surrender. And uh, I invite you to sing along. If uh, this song of surrender is not something you could sing at the time, at this moment, uh, I just invite you to pray through uh, what we're considering surrendering. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee take my voice and let me sing always only for my king take my lips and messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mind would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Would you please stand and sing with us?
prayer to say, take it all, even in our gold and our silver, it is yours. If you want to talk more about the kind of heavenly father that's been so generous through his son, Jesus Christ, if you want to know what it means to know him more and to have a relationship with him, I'd love to speak with you afterward. Or if you just have questions about our church, we'll have elders up here, our staff, we'd love to interact with you. But as we go, let's say our benediction together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in his grace today.